Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webcast where we'll be discussing how to accelerate your Databricks Unity catalog migration. This is our agenda for the day. Coming out of this session, our objectives are to understand what Unity Catalog is, what are the benefits of implementing it within your Databricks workspaces, and how to get started on the migration from existing workspaces to Unity Catalog. Brief introduction, my name is Felipe, and I am a Data and AI consultant here at Fargood, based out of our Sao Paulo office. I am joined from Boston by my colleague, Brendan, who is a data and AI consultant as well. To share an overview of Fergood, we are a global independent consultancy firm specializing in data and AI strategy, solutions, and services. We approach data and AI initiatives by focusing on business goals and opportunities while considering what is possible from a data and technology perspective. Ultimately, we identify and deliver ways to address those business objectives through expert application of data and AI. We offer a wide range of services from end-to-end -end implementations to architecture and strategy design, training, and user enablement. We often find ourselves working in four main industries, consumer goods and manufacturing, pharma and healthcare, banking, and insurance. The organizations we work with are usually large global companies who are leaders in their respective industries and key players in the data and AI field. Currently, we have been working with some of these customers in their Unity catalog migration as well. Additionally, we are partners with Databricks and have continually leveraged it to deliver solutions and advise on strategy with our customers for the better part of the last decade. We have a number of Databricks champions within Foragood and we are part of the Brick Builder program. All this along with attending the latest Databricks events, such as the Data and AI Summit back in June, are ways we stay skilled and up to date on the latest Databricks capabilities and can help our customers apply them to achieve their business goals. We see a lot of value in Databricks and we are equipped to deliver it across the main cloud providers and integrate it with other key vendors. Our technology independence gives us the ability to maintain a good awareness of the market latest advancements, and consider how to apply a wide array of tools to the best effect, depending on the problems or objectives at hand, as well as the specific technologies and resources our customers use. And without further ado, let's talk about Databricks and Unity Catalog. For starters, Unity Catalog is a data governance tool developed by the same creators of Databricks that was recently open sourced during the latest Databricks Data and AI Summit. This means that you can even adopt Unity Catalog without a Databricks workspace, but we won't focus on that during this event. So if we think about the Databricks platform, for the last few years, it has been heavily focusing on enabling the data lake house, which in simple terms involves benefiting from the flexibility, cost efficiency, and scale of data lakes, while also having a data management layer available in regular data warehouses. The Databricks Lake House architecture relies heavily on Delta Lake, an optimized storage layer that provides the foundation for tables in the Lake House on Databricks. Over the years, we've seen our customers dumping increasing amounts of data into data lakes, and the Lake House architecture has never been more relevant. One of the main issues we've seen our customers facing is how hard it is to govern and manage all data that is collected and stored within those data lakes. What Unity Catalog does is it provides an additional metadata layer that sits on top of your Databricks workspaces and enables users to have centralized, fine-grained access control with enhanced security across your organization. Previously, it was very difficult or even impossible to control how Databricks users consume the lake house. But now you can limit user access for only the specific objects they need and even control permissions and which privileges different users can have on each of these objects. Now, if we think about the main features provided by Unity Catalog, we have unified governance. So Unity Catalog offers a single place to administer data access policies that apply across all workspaces. The security model is based on standard SQL and allows admins to grant permissions to their existing data lake using familiar syntax. In many ways, it feels like you're managing a traditional relational database or data warehouse. With data sharing, users can easily access any tables within their organization from any workspaces under the same region, as well as share data externally in an easy and secure way through the Unity Catalog interface. It automatically captures user-level audit logs that record access to your data, 
providing auditing capabilities, and it captures lineage data that tracks how data and AI assets are created and used. So it makes it easy to understand where data is coming from and how to get to the actual source of truth for your data assets. Finally, Unity Catalog lets you tag and document data assets, and it provides a search interface to help data consumers with data discovery. With insights, you can see how and where your users are consuming your tables, which helps developers to understand how and where data is being used and act proactively to make data improvements. Now, what I want to share is where Unity Catalog fits in within a modern platform. The first thing we have at the foundation of the entire platform is the data lake, where enterprise data is stored in interoperable formats, and you can have data organized across different domains, functions, or level of processing. On top of your data lake, you have the delta lake, which is a standard storage format for your data lake that helps enabling the lake house architecture. Unity Catalog sits on top of this foundation. It starts with a Metastore, which is the top level container that registers metadata about data assets and the permissions that govern access to them. You can visualize and manage your objects entirely from the catalog layer, which means that users can access data stored in the data lake without having direct access to the data lake itself. Unity Catalog also enables the usage of many other tools. For data exchanges, both internally and externally, you can use Delta Sharing, an open data sharing protocol that works very well with Unity Catalog and enables easy sharing by establishing a provider and recipient for the data. It is not only limited to Databricks to Databricks sharing, but you can also use it to share data from Databricks to many other external compute platforms. Unity Catalog also enables some Databricks-centric features. With a proper setup of Unity Catalog, you can very quickly benefit from Genie, a tool that provides an interface that enables users to ask questions in natural language about data assets. Also, any permissions granted to users will be inherited by Genie and will be taken in consideration when it answers any questions. The governance and lineage tools are really helpful for end users to understand the source of truth of data and AI assets, and it also empowers admins and data stewards to manage privileges and quickly understand how applications were built and how data is flowing between multiple layers. It also supports integration with other tool sets in major cloud platforms and even with other data governance tools. Unity Catalog has open APIs and open source server offers, which enables flexibility and customer choice by ensuring broad interoperability. It can also be a point of connection for data visualization tools such as Power BI and Tableau. And users can engage with data in Unity Catalog through familiar tools and languages, empowering data analysts and developers. Now that we went through what Unity Catalog is, I will share a quick demo of a simple use case that we've built within our internal environments. We have created a combination of facts and dimensions for this demonstration, and we have data movement across different layers in a medallion architecture. All right, now I'm in, I'm at my Databricks workspace, and I will get started in the Catalog Explorer, where we can see all catalogs that I have access to from this workspace. I will start this server list cluster, and then proceed to the UC demo catalog. So within this catalog, you can see I have a few schemas. Default and information schema are created by default when you create a new catalog. And I have created the other four schemas, bronze, gold, raw, and silver. Now let's select the gold schema and we will see a few tables in there. I will now select the fact sales table. And now we can see specific details in the overview pane. I would like you to pay attention to the description and comments you can apply to this object. These informative fields are relevant for data discovery and work as additional metadata and context that will be provided to Genie when querying this data in natural language. Another cool feature is since I enable primary and foreign key constraints when creating these tables, I can click on view relationships and see how my tables relate to each other. Moving on, I can click on the sample data tab and we see a data preview for this table so we can have a quick glance at the data. Next, we have the details tab. And here you can see the type of table, storage location, and a few other properties. On the permissions tab, you can easily see existing privileges that principals have on this object, as well as grant or revoke access. By clicking on grant, you'll be taken to the screen where you can select the principles and the specific permissions you wish to grant. Next on the history tab, you can track the latest operations performed on this object. You can see, for example, the last time data was written to this table was on October 2nd, and then there were adjustments to table properties as well as a few column changes. Now on the lineage tab, you will see lineage information about this table, and you can investigate 
which tables share dependencies with it, both upstream and downstream, as well as notebooks that use this table, dashboards, queries, and so on. If we click on the C lineage graph icon, you will be taken to this diagram that displays the lineage for this object, and you can see it has a direct dependency on the silver sales table. What I can do next is expand this lineage by clicking on these plus icons. And once we go through all of this, we'll be able to see the entire lineage for my end-to-end -end application. Another cool feature is that we can see how columns are derived from upstream tables. So if I click on the dollars column of my silver sales table, we can see how it is a combination of price from the product table and units from the sales table. Now in the insights page, we can see the usage of this table over the last 30 days, along with frequent users, dashboards, notebooks, joint tables and queries. I think this information is valuable and allows developers to quickly have an overview of how data is being consumed and act proactively to make improvements and adjustments to data pipelines. Last thing I wanted to show is Genie. So if I navigate to Genie right here and select my Genie workspace, I am now in this interface and I can ask any questions I want. Before doing that, I will just take a look at the connected tables in the data tab. And we can see this Genie workspace is connected to DIM employee, fact sales, and DIM product. If I click on explain the data set, you will see that Genie will provide a general overview of the connected data. Notice that it takes into consideration the additional metadata I provided previously on the description and comments of the connected tables. Next, I will ask Genie a specific question, such as what is my unit sales by employee, by product, and by month? Now you can see that Genie is thinking, and then it will provide my result as requested after processing my question. Another nice functionality is it enables you to click on this show generated code icon and we can see the SQL query it generated based on my questions. Just like that. That was all I had to share and now I will hand over to Brendan so we can understand how to perform the migration to Unity Catalog. All right. Thank you, Felipe. Now, after seeing Unity Catalog and some of the features and actions, you now be sort of be asking yourselves, what can Unity Catalog bring to my organization? So we'll get into next just some additional considerations and the value added of the technology within your organization. And this list certainly won't be exhaustive, but are more so things that we've pulled based off our knowledge of the tool. And we'll just dive into a bit later for each of these considerations as well later in the presentation too. So first, just want to acknowledge that Unity Catalog is relatively new, but a certainly evolving technology. And I think with any new technology, there are going to be new standards and practices that we need to be able to adopt and incorporate within our organization. But we can't just stop and drop everything, you know, to implement this new Unity Catalog technology. We do need to think about how we can do so while still continuing on with our existing operations and our existing Databricks workloads. And with Unity Catalog, given, again, that it is a new technology, we need to make sure that we have the appropriate knowledge within our team so that we can upscale our teams to, to make the most out of it and all of its advanced features. And lastly, arguably, most importantly, is that within Unity Catalog, there are certainly some legacy Databricks features that are deprecated. So I've just listed out a couple here as examples, but mount points uh, as, as one that comes to mind are not an accepted access pattern going forward. So instead to access your data lake storage, you need to define or create volumes or other external locations so that you can query as you normally would. So with the various functionality that is being deprecated, we need to be conscious of the effort needed to not just actually use the technology, but to refactor a lot of our existing code as well. We do know firsthand that data governance is a challenging problem to solve and get right. And Unity Catalog will help with that. So as Felipe was walking through, it brings together a lot of the tools you need and some new ones too, like lineage, auditing, and, and just general access control that really opens things up for you to have better control of your data state. Also, as Felipe mentioned, to, to use some of those new features like AI and BI Genie, you need to have Unity Catalog enabled to get the most that a Databricks has to offer. And it's going to be the same with some new features that are being rolled out too. So you'll need to ensure that you have Unity Catalog enabled. Unity Catalog is an integral part to what Databricks is calling its data intelligence platform. So we're sort of expecting that those new features and future features will follow a similar path to what the AI BI Genie has indeed followed.
And lastly, you know, the organizations have made a pretty substantial investment into their data lakes and their overall data platforms. So I think just with the way in which Unity Catalog can democratize, you know, data for others can really help get those teams to get more value out of the investments in which they've been making over the past several years. Right. So now we've talked a little bit about Unity Catalog, the value you can bring to your organization. The next natural questions are, how do I get there and what else do I need to consider? Right. So it's the fact of the matter is that there's really no one size fits all solution for you in an organization. What we'll talk about in this section are some key considerations that you may want to weigh based off of some of our prior experience with our clients. So we'll introduce these main buckets as a bit of a framework of what we've seen be effective in adopting and migrating to Unity Catalog and again, working with our customers recently. But firstly, we view this migration as a progression, right? And that progression begins with the proper architecture, the proper analysis and the proper design. So there's really a lot to consider with respect to catalog design and implementation that requires, you know, something well thought out. We next have the actual design decisions that are needed to, of course, be pondered as the organization and the preparation required to actually execute on that migration. And then lastly, but certainly not least, you have the actual execution. And this is one that we've obviously worked with quite carefully. And it's important to, again, strike that balance of knowing when to migrate the legacy and existing production applications to the catalog. And of course, making sure that all the configuration and alignment that, that predicates it is in place so that end users can really still rely on these applications once the catalog is indeed adopted. So what we'll be doing on these next few slides is talking about them in, in a little bit more detail. I think two of the big things that we've discussed with our customers when coming alongside their Unity Catalog migrations are their respective catalog architectures as well as their strategy for data provisioning. I think as we've chatted about, Unity Catalog does provide a really great way to share data and having the design in place to help do this will help considerably in really making the most of what it can do for you and your organization. So let's start with the catalogs themselves. And I guess just to take it back up one moment, the way in which users can access their respective data within a Unity Catalog workspace is by accessing what's called the three-level namespace. And that's just the concatenation of a catalog, a schema, and a table. And this catalog is effectively the highest level in which you can store and provision your data within Unity Catalog. And to take it down a step further, we then have schemas, which sit directly under catalogs. We typically have seen organizations at the schema level demarcate and organize their data in two different ways. The first one is by the type of data, right? So a user may have a schema that touches on all financial information, a schema that touches on all sales information, and then maybe another one that you know holds all reference or dimensions like employee or time data. Alternatively, as Felipe walked through, we've also seen customers use different schemas as a way to expose data as it becomes more curated from its raw form. So having those schemas sort of represent your bronze, silver, and gold layers, as Felipe was sort of suggesting earlier. And ultimately, again, it's just another way to control and organize your data and use some of the tool set that Unity Catalog has to offer on top of it. And finally, we have our finest screen within Unity Catalog. So this is where you're going to have data objects that are directly accessible to users. So if you think about what a table may look like within a particular schema, we could have data, for example, that we're collecting from our upstream CRM application that we're persisting as tables that maybe has our marketing context and any of the events that they may have attended. So I think the important thing to understand within Unity Catalog here is that permission and access propagates through all these different levels that we just walked through. So if I give someone read or select access on a catalog, that's going to ripple down to every schema and every table that sits underneath it as well. The organization that ultimately the access control is something that is important to consider too. And what we found simply is that having those dedicated, you know, AD groups be assigned to have certain permissions, it's just a much easier way to provision data access as a whole within Unity Catalog, as opposed to, you know, one-off access, right? Which is an access pattern that isn't necessarily new, but you know, still something that should and can still be followed within Unity Catalog. And I think one interesting call it as well within Unity Catalog is that it becomes easier to access say, production level data from a catalog to the development workspace within another. So having that cross environment access sort of enabled. And of course, cross environment access is, is not something that is allowed or encouraged at different organizations. We still feel like it's relevant to call out that facilitating some of those data movements to refresh development environments with production data becomes much easier with Unity Catalog. And of course, this comes with additional governance considerations as to how to determine if this is even an option for you and your teams, but we figured it's worth calling out because you know, it's certainly personally I feel like I've been on the wrong end of, you know, having to develop on dev level data, whereas the production level data is something where I want to replicate certain scenarios in, in my own development. 
But we'll touch on next to some considerations when it comes to the preparation and configuration to really set yourself up for success when it comes to the actual migration to Unity Catalog. So the first is being programmatic with the way in which you're creating these different Unity Catalog objects. And it seems simple enough, right? But we've been pulled into situations where we've seen some customers that we've worked with try to create a lot of these objects manually, set permissions manually, and it's made the actual implementation and adoption of Unity Catalog quite challenging. So tables weren't able to be accessed by managed identities. Users couldn't select tables that they used to go to for their day-to-day -day because tables weren't there and, and so on, right? So what we've been able to do for our clients in a few different ways, sort of depending on their code standards and access patterns and designs, is to find those programmatic approaches so that you know that your tables are being created, they're being created automatically, and they're being created correctly. So of course, we'll be more than happy to share some of these approaches beyond these incomplete snippets here, just obviously for demonstration purposes. Something else that we feel is important to call out too is the need for organizational alignment when it comes to the adoption of Unity Catalog. So how Unity Catalog works is that you can only have one meta store for a given region. And with most of the global clients that we work with, there are you know up to dozens of Databricks workspaces that are hosted out of one given region. So it means that for someone to actually go about and migrate to Unity Catalog, there are steps that need to be taken, not only locally and for you know that local infrastructure that's under a given team's remit, but also making sure that they're aligned with broader technical organizations within your perhaps global business to align with those organizational standards. And lastly here, we have having the proper team in place to support when you eventually migrate to Unity Catalog. So frankly, as we've kind of talked about, there are some nuances to this technology that need to be understood to properly support the system. So there's, of course, the technical need, which is obvious. But something that we've seen, too, is that because this data is so much more democratized and easily shareable with other people, there is a lot of demand for it. Right. So with more demand comes more questions of your team and requests for access, requests for clarification, and just overall, you know, more time required out of your data team to service a larger population of data consumers. So having the means to triage data requests is just something that we feel is particularly important given the data is just much more accessible and just means, you know, having you know, appropriate processes in place for, for change management with this new democratization as well. And finally, we have the actual execution of these migrations. I think the classic challenge and talked to it a couple of times before is knowing when to cut over to this new solution, right? So with the clients that we've worked with, we're dealing with, you know, Databricks workspaces that contain full-fledged productionized applications. So changes need to be made to a lot of legacy code, but at the same time, we can't just stop any new feature development when we're working on this migration. So we've been working with our clients so that we can, you know, toe that line appropriately. And there are a lot of compromises and decisions that need to be made, of course, so that we can still meet our business objectives without compromising on the success of migrating our legacy tooling to those new features, to the Unity Catalog. Again, we can't just stop development, drop everything. We need to make sure that we can do both simultaneously, which is a challenge in itself to making sure that we're not hindering any delivered value. One of the things that we touched on a bit earlier too is that, you know, there is a need to cut over to Unity Catalog because it is a core tenant of Databricks data intelligence platform going forward. So to access the relevant data governance features as well as some of the new capabilities like Felipe was walking through earlier with the AIBI Genie, we need to do this migration because again, it's that core positioning from Databricks. And it's becoming the default for a lot of this new functionality as well. So we'll need to consider that if we want to take advantage of these new and evolving features and get continuously involving features as well, we need to be looking as to how we can migrate to Unity Catalog. So again, another balance to be struck to how to use these features appropriately and how they can be envisioned within your organization. But finally, you know, we can look at this Unity Catalog migration as an opportunity. Right. So we've seen it done in multiple ways. So some of our customers have elected to migrate whole workspaces and kind of start fresh with completely new ones and use it as an opportunity to clean up any unneeded notebooks or tables and give themselves a fresh start with their given data objects. Others, on the other hand, have chosen to just refactor existing workspaces and effectively turn on Unity Catalog where they already are operating. So Kind of a spectrum on both ways. And in our experiences, you know, it's a pros and cons situation where you need to evaluate where you are and where you would like to go and the effort sort of required. And ultimately with Unity Catalog, you're presented with a lot of opportunity and, and really sophisticated features that are really exciting and, and powerful within the realm of data and AI that allow you to govern, share, access, and glean insights in your data in, in very compelling ways. So as we sort of get to the conclusion of the presentation today, we'd also just want to love to hear more about you and your interest in Unity Catalog. So what we'd like to do is offer a 
one hour complimentary consultation for those interested in discussing you need to tell like more with us and our consultants so that we can you know answer any additional questions that you may have and just so that we can share our experiences in a bit more detail so we have this qr code on the screen here I encourage you to, to scan it and felipe and i's contact information will be on the final screen here where you can also reach out to us directly and of course feel free to reach out to us at any time so thank you again all for joining our session today we'd like to wish you all a great rest of your day and thank you for joining us